Welcome to Case Flash, brought to you by the CBA Family Law Section. With me today are Judge Elaine Gordon and Attorney Alan Palmer. I'm Sam Schoonmaker. Today's Case Flash addresses the new financial affidavit forms uh, that are going to be used in family law cases. Uh, Judge Gordon, what was the impetus for these new family law forms? Well, the old financial affidavit um, hadn't been modified since uh, Judge Friedman, Fred Friedman, had been the uh, chief administrative judge for family back in the uh, 1980s. And I think that people felt that with the heavy manuscripting down in Fairfield County, I think that was a pretty much a hint that maybe the financial affidavit wasn't addressing all of the needs that the litigants might have. And so the Family Commission um, and some of the staff inside of the judicial branch took up the uh, job of trying to come up with a new financial affidavit form, and they've been working on it for about the last two years. Okay. And the result Maybe of a little the, longer, I'm sorry. And the result of this effort was actually two forms. The result of the effort turned out to be two forms after some discussion. Um, I'm not really sure at which meeting somebody thought uh, maybe there should be two forms because people might find themselves in um, different circumstances and one form might not need to be as complex for certain people as others. There was a subcommittee that um, worked on this uh, really diligently and they surveyed all of the financial affidavits used throughout the country and tried to figure out which ones worked and what was in them and this I can tell you um, is quite a change for us to look at but um, it's apparently the long form is not as long as some and the short form is not as short as others um, and so we seem to be right kind of in the middle of the information that's uh, uh, sought by courts throughout the country. Attorney Palmer, can you tell us about income in both the long and short forms? Um, their their income is not consistent on both forms. There there are things included on the long form that aren't on the short form, and I my concern is that the items that are included on the long form some may apply to persons who should be filing a short form. Uh, for instance, things like commissions, bonuses. Uh, pension money, retirement money are included on the long form but not included on the short form and I certainly can envision someone with less than $75,000 in assets on a modest pension income not being able to go with the short form because simply because of the fact they're receiving pension money. Can you explain that if someone has a uh, $75,000 a year of income or $75,000 a year of a uh, or $75,000 of assets they use the short form that's right. right. And if, yes. if you're in excess of seventy-five thousand dollars of either income assets, then you use the long form. Correct. Right. Okay. Can you just using the uh, the new affidavit forms? Are they do they run alongside the child support guidelines? Is it just the same as the guidelines calculation, or is it something different? It, it breaks out the individual line items that would normally be included on the child support guidelines worksheet uh, into more detail. It doesn't provide total numbers, which the uh, guidelines worksheet does. So you can't just take a number off of your financial affidavit and plug it directly into the guidelines? No, I, no you, you couldn't. Okay. Uh, with respect to the, uh, the expenses portion of the affidavit, are there any significant changes there? Did you see any significant changes? Uh, one interesting change, which I saw in the long form, uh, which is included on page uh, three, just above the uh, liability section, is a line item for extraordinary travel expenses related to visitation with the children. And there's no real definition given for that. And I can envision non-custodial parents making the argument that because gasoline jumped from 350 a gallon to 425 a gallon, that all of a sudden they have extraordinary travel expenses related to the visitation of their children when they're traveling from Norwalk to New Haven to see their kids. Yeah. Okay, moving on to um, to liabilities, is there any significant change to the liability section or is that pretty much wide open the way it was in the old form? The li liability section on the old form was simply a, 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 about an eight line list. Uh, the new financial affidavit form breaks out the liability section into specific liabilities, credit card debt, other consumer debt, tax debt, so it's actually broken out instead of the reader, either the other party, the other lawyer, or the court, uh, having to break it out on, on their own. You know, it's interesting when you just said that, I was thinking about um, 
writing decisions and how the decisions of family judges through rulings by the appellate Supreme Court have had to become more and more detailed. And I wonder if this is going to lead us to not just talking about the obligations of the parties, but really having to, even in a decision, now start breaking things out in just the way they've been given to us. It's a lot of detail. And to get into the lifestyle of the parties right. for that purpose? Well, for either for the lifestyle of the parties or, or need, need yeah. or whatever, you know, if, you're, if you've ever taken into account their debt, are you going to have to take into account their tax debt differently than their uh, consumer debt? Or, I mean, or, you know, for years we've been saying we don't really, you know, you owe us first, but I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see what people make of all the detail. Okay. Moving on to the asset section. Uh, are there any significant changes to the asset section, which is, of course, much more detailed than the old asset section? I, I think that's the general theme of the affidavits in general. E even on the short form, things are, are described in much greater detail than they were on the old financial affidavit form. Uh, in, in doing this, I don't know whether it was oversight or whether it was done by design, um, but they describe a lot of different types of pension assets but there's no line item simply for a deferred asset that might not be a retirement asset, for instance. Uh, there's no line item for options, uh, for stock options, even though there are line items for various other uh, uh, company type uh, equities. Um, and lastly, under the children's assets, which is a new section on the financial affidavit, um, there's a, uh, in the instructions, it appears to state that you're supposed to list a 529 account. Under, under the Internal Revenue Code, uh, a, a 529 account is not a completed gift. Technically, it's still an asset of the grantor, so it's really not a, children, a child's asset for tax purposes or for title purposes, yet for purposes of the financial affidavit form, a 529 account is going to be considered a, an asset of the children. But when you talk about assets of the children, those are not included in the total of the assets of the parties. There's a, a, a total line at the end of the form uh, where you're asked to add up the cash value of all the assets. The children's assets are not added to the value of the uh, the party other. Um, there's one other item on the, the new uh, list of assets I thought was interesting was inheritances. Uh, that's um, Under other assets, they have something called inheritances. What do you think belongs on a financial affidavit under the category of, of inheritances? Well, that's an interesting question. We were talking about this uh, before we taped, and um, uh, I, I'm not sure if it refers to inheritances already received, and is it, are, is, this, is this a question of, are any of the assets listed above inheritances, or is it inheritances, inheritances that you expect, and does that mean an inheritance that names you as the beneficiary at this moment, or only an inheritance that names you as the irrevocable beneficiary for all time. I'm not really sure. Um, I, I, I concur with, with Judge Gordon on that. It would, If it was an expectancy, uh, someone's parents may die 10 years in the future, and th that person might get an inheritance, I think it's contrary to the established case law under Rubin in the line of cases, which says that an interest in a parent's or another relative's estate who is still living is not necessarily an asset for purposes of, of equitable distribution. Right, because a parent could just change the will. A parent could just change the will. Suddenly it's time. not your inheritance anymore. And also, I I an inheritance that already received years in the future, that would show up, uh, maybe that would show up in a bank account that's already on the financial affidavit somewhere. So I wouldn't think you have to list it a second time uh, just because you got it by inheritance. Um, so I, I think my, my guess is what this means is vested inheritance but not yet received. That's, that's my guess. But I, I mean, it can't be mere expectancy. I can't imagine that you list a mere expectancy as an asset because that's totally contrary to the case. Of law. Maybe it's personal property. Maybe it's that Patek Philippe, you know, that uh, um, that you got from your grandfather. I don't really, you know, I think it's an interesting question because it's not defined on the form. Yeah. Another item on the uh, the form is funds held uh, in escrow, including money held uh, by an attorney. So I, I guess that um, money held uh, as a as a retainer uh, should go on. Onto the form. Returning back to inheritance for a minute, what happens if an inheritance is received but it appears in a brokerage account which is listed somewhere else on the financial affidavit? It, it technically is an inheritance received from grandma or grandpa, 
but it, it's it's in a, in a separate account already listed on the fi on the financial affidavit. Right. So you don't want to double count it. Are we opening the door though for people to claim this is not a marital asset because it was inherited? Otherwise, it would be under the brokerage part of our account. Well, I think the interesting thing in this is that it's recognizing inheritances as if they're a different class. And under our case law, well, perhaps not under our case law, but under our statute. We're all in. Yeah. Everything's in. And it's in without any discrimination. And um, it's we can transfer, you know, the courts can transfer anything from it to anybody. Yeah. And it's only the case law that starts giving, giving us some guidelines on how we might go about thinking about what it, what's an equitable division of everything that's in. And I do think that what's been interesting is that I've seen financial affidavits in the last five years uh, the number of financial affidavits in the last five years that have started to say marital, premarital, asterisk inheritance has skyrocketed. And people are trying to carve out, you know, coverture periods and this and that. Nothing that's provided for in the law of this state. And I am a little bit concerned that the form might now be doing it on behalf of the judicial branch. So some people might use this as an advocacy document. Right. That, that line inheritance is. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, there's other, another interesting line on the last page of the long form. Um, <laughs> it says, important, if you have other financial information that has not yet been disclosed, you have an affirmative duty to disclose that information. List additional information below. So it's not a, an asset, it's not income, it's not a liability or an expense, but it's additional financial information. Attorney Palmer, what do you think uh, the, the purpose is of this category? I'm not sure, but I'd be concerned given the uh, given the dis uh, the notice at the beginning of the financial affidavit form, which specifically says, under the certification, I understand that willful misrepresentation of any of the information provided will subject me to sanctions and may result in criminal charges being filed against me. So, if you elect to disclose additional information, you better make sure it's true, or you're going to be held accountable under the first part of the affidavit. Um, we discussed this a little bit during the production meeting, and one of the things that, that I often have clients ask me to put on a financial affidavit, which I don't, is a college obligation for a child in the future. Your child's eight years old, it's expected that the eight-year-old is eventually going to reach 18 or 19 years old and go to college, but the divorce is going to be long over for, uh, by then. And they will put that obligation to their kids or want to put their that obligation to the kids on their financial affidavit. Yeah, and what doesn't go on a financial affidavit under this category? Yeah, if my parents get sick, I'm going to I'm going to take care of them. Does that go on the financial affidavit? Uh, I think the financial affidavit is supposed to be a snapshot of that which already exists, not what you're worried about into the future. Those are all you know potential. I mean, in, in speculative uh, obligations, but I think this is basically saying because we have divided this out into all these subcategories and given you new subcategories. Um, you know, we now have arts and antiques and we have jewelry, which didn't used to be on there. And um, crop, we even have crops and livestock um, under assets, at least on the uh, uh, long form. And that we're saying, if don't we don't want you to think that any of our categories are the only categories. These are not exclusionary of everything else that you might have. So if by any chance we forgot something, it's your obligation, you have an affirmative duty to tell it. Some of the other things that should be considered under this uh, catch-all certification at the end of the financial affidavit are, are things such as what happened in, in the Weinstein case where one of the parties uh, had an offer to sell a business and never disclosed the information about the offer. Um, other uh, situations might exist uh, where there's a question as to whether something is an asset or a liability and you may want to for, for safety's sake, put that on the financial affidavit. So, so there are items that, that could fit in there that certainly are relevant, but the way the question is posed, it would include things that some people may not be able to produce, such as insider information that may affect stock value. Well, the financial affidavit in the divorce court requires it disclosed. Federal law says you can't disclose it. Um, so that, that's a, a rub right there. Yeah, I guess you have to lodge that. I think you're just going to get, you can get very, very long financial affidavits from certain attorneys in every case. Very, very long affidavits. Um, so, uh, and I also think people may classify, um, they may try to classify things that aren't really property into this category here and say, well, I already, I already disclosed it, it was already dealt with in the equitable division. So uh, going forward, 
uh, in, in terms of alimony modification, child support modification, it shouldn't be considered. Right. I think that it's going to be interesting to see how some of this plays out because we've asked for more information and it's very open-ended. You know, before we close, I'd like to go back to the beginning of the uh, form. Uh, under after instructions, there's a thing that says certification, and it says I understand um, that the information stated on this financial statement and the attached schedules, if any, is complete, true, and accurate. I understand that willful misrepresentation of any information provided will subject me to sanctions and may result in criminal charges being filed against me. Um, it's pretty clear right from the get-go on this financial affidavit, something that wasn't in the future, that if you are uh, going to willfully misrepresent or withhold um, information, um, that you're going to be subject to sanctions. And the sanctions are the sanctions that the court can have on this kind of thing, given the fiduciary relationship of the parties, um, to disclose information to um, keep somebody from putting on any evidence or take, taking one person's side is true. So um, right from the get-go, you know that the court has some power over you. My, my concern, however, is that the specific sanctions are not set forth here, and the, under Chapter 13, there's no specific sanction for filing a willful, willfully misrepresented financial affidavit. And right. I think the court will rely on its inherent power uh, to compel honest discovery and to uh, levy sanctions for people who do lie in court uh, under, under that section. Right, and, it, and it's interesting because maybe we need something to close the loop at some point that says the financial affidavit is part of the disclosure process, and if that because we have a lot of case law and sanctions that deal with um, disclosure and discovery. Yeah. So the financial affidavits um, are very important to the practice, and these are major developments. Thank you for watching Case Flash.